This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 27th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we look at why some are pushing for a special session to pass the Cook Inlet royalty relief bills that stalled out during the regular session. Second, we look at what Shell's decision to relinquish its West Harrison Bay oil and gas leases means for Alaska oil and gas. And third, we ask, as many should, where's the phase two utility report on South Central gas? And now, Let's join Michael. Let's uh, let's get started with the weekly top three. Uh, talking to begin with about more subsidies and a potential special session? Question mark during an election year? I mean, come on, it, that 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 seems unusual. Give me the give me the rundown here. Well, Michael, the the one leftover it seems that the one leftover issue from the legislature that that will not die is uh, this proposal to subsidize consumers, utilities, producers, subsidize somebody uh, in the Cook Inlet by, by reducing, substantially reducing royalties for uh, Cook Inlet gas. And Cook, in, Cook Inlet oil. By the end of the session, they were also subsidizing, they were also reducing uh, right. uh, royalties. For I Cook saw Inlet that pop up just out of nowhere all of a sudden, it was Cook Inlet oil. I'm like, we haven't talked about this all. What the, what? Well, that's a cross subsidy. I mean, basically, what they're trying to do is is get more. there was there was a pushback to reducing uh, royalties, gas royalties to zero. So I think they reduced them. The last the last uh, 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 provision I saw reduced them to like three percent, and then they threw over threw in oil and oil. And by reducing oil, since since there's since mo- a lot of the Cook Inlet gas is produced in association with oil. Or oils produced in association with the gas. However, you want to look at it. Uh, reducing the the uh, the royalty on oil would also get money to the same producers that you're trying to encourage to uh, to develop more gas. And so it's really a cross subsidy from the oil side to the gas side. But I mean, Alaska uh, uh, families, Alaska revenues are taking a hit, even a greater hit, if you if you reduce the the, the subsidies or, or reduce the royalties on oil as well. So it's uh it's just another effort to to push money out of uh, for the money to give back revenue uh, over to uh, over to producers or utilities or consumers, what however you want to however you want to phrase this, um, that uh, that stat that that proposal died at the end of the legislature. It got to Senate Finance. Senate Finance wasn't convinced it was something that the state ought to be doing, um, and so Senate Finance didn't forward it. Didn't get to the Senate uh, floor. It wasn't otherwise called up in one of those stuffing bills that they did. Um, and so it uh, uh, died at the end at the end of the session. There are some who are who are pushing to revive it. John Sims, there's a headline, there's an article in the Alaska News Source, the the Channel Two News Source. Headline is NSTAR President Encourages Special Session to Address Natural Gas Short Shortfall. Um, and uh, and Sims keeps keeps pressing forward for that. And there's a little bit of indication that Dunleavy is is paying attention to it. There's a, a headline again from uh, uh, Alaska News Source uh, a couple of days later that says Dunleavy staff still working to understand what Cook Inlet 
gas development legislation will mean. And there's a there's a piece in that story buried where it talks about Dunleavy isn't ruling out a special session, potentially may consider uh, a special session. So there's 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 some momentum for that. Sims is trying to trying to, you know, shake the crisis tree and say it's a crisis. It's a crisis. We need to address this crisis and, and get Dunleavy to uh, to do it what, one one more time. I mean, we've said this repeatedly. This is not something that John Sims doesn't have control over. If NSTAR doesn't have control over, if there is, uh, if, if, you, if royalties really are the problem, uh, if, if the, the, the additional economics that are, that are factored into a producer's decision by having to pay royalties, if those really are a problem, what happens in other states or what's happened in other states when that's a problem is you add a royalty clause to uh, to your contract. And you say, look, I'll reimburse you for your royalties. The purchaser reimburses the producer for the royalties and takes the economic uh, takes the economic burden of that over onto the purchaser side. Uh, and the and the producer no longer has an issue with it because he's being reimbursed for the royalties. And so if that's really if that's really an issue, uh, then Sims has Sims and the other utilities have the answer in their own in their in their own control. They can they can write the XX royalty clause offered to the producers. And if that's really what's holding the producers up, uh, then the producers can accept that royalty clause and and the economics are are taken care of. The fact this issue will not die, uh, and the fact that keep people continue push pushing push for this royalty relief has made me suspicious all along. There's something else going on. Uh, that either uh, producers are there's something that producers see in this legislation uh, that uh, that gives them an added incentive over and above royalty, uh, or there's there's just some other consideration that's that's factored in here uh, that hasn't been made public that isn't transparent. Uh, but that's where we are. I mean, the, there is a there is some consideration for. Um, don't kick the table. That's the lesson out of that, you know, shake. <laughs> uh, there, there, that's the, that's the lesson out of, um, out of, out of this, that, that there's, that, you know, they're, they're still pressing for, uh, they're still pressing for uh, royalty relief. There's also the other piece of legislation that didn't get passed. That was, that was initially proposed as part of the cooking lunch, uh, relief was the state essentially buying a jackup rig a rig that's usable in the cook in the waters of the cook inlet right um and and buying that and bringing it up and leasing it uh to uh, to producers essentially you know the argument was well that's just a piece of infrastructure it's like a road we put in or it's like a you know like any any other piece of infrastructure that we put in but but that's not typically that's not typically something that the state takes on or or any any lessor takes on it's right. an obligation that's part of the producer's obligation to you know develop the leases. He has to get the equipment there to develop the leases. And again, it's a subsidy uh, in the sense that uh, in the sense that the state would bring it up, state would pay for it and bring it up, uh, and the producer uh, would would rent it. But there's there's not a particular great amount of clarity about whether the rental rates would be compensatory right. to the cost I mean, of the rate. And why would, again, why would that be the state's responsibility in those kind of situations? I mean, why would they have to, that's normally a producer side. I mean, you keep saying that, you know, that there's, that there's, there seems to be something more to this. And I, and I, I too, just in, in the periphery watching this, not understanding the full, you know, I, I don't have an oil and gas background like you do, but even in watching the way that this just keeps coming back and keeps coming back, it seems like there is something more to this, like there's something seen there and they keep pushing on that crisis button over and over and over again. Um, I mean, what is it? I mean, what in your in your opinion, what is it here that's that's causing this to not die? I know, uh, you know, John Hendricks is the producer that everybody says is going to benefit from this. Hendricks is the one that's got a field out there, the kitchen lights field. That he's been complaining about the royalties about forever, and uh, and saying that the royalties uh, make the field uneconomic, and so everybody says, well, this bill is really for John Hendricks to to uh, to go out and develop uh, develop these leases. 
it may be that there's other producers out there that are sort of hiding behind the log, hiding behind the John Hendricks log or hiding behind the, uh, the, 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 we have a crisis log and sitting there saying, you know, if we can get this royalty provision through, oh baby, oh, you know, we're going to, we're going to do things now. There may be additional developments. There may be, um, additional activity that they would undertake if, if the royalty is released and, and they're using Hendricks as sort of the front and this crisis as sort of the front, uh, to cover that. I, you know, I, I don't know, uh, but there's not been a whole lot of transparency about it. And again, as I say, this is, if you take at face value, what, what the, the producers have said, what NSTAR has said, what DNR has said, DNR made this long presentation before, before house finance at one point that, you know, showed why, how the royalty relief would economically benefit, uh, benefit the producer. Um, and, you know, my reaction to that was, well, you just proved my case. I mean, you just proved that if NSTAR and the utilities would enter into the excess royalty clause or enter, enter into a royalty clause uh, with the producers, you would cover the economics and we'd be, you know, we'd be, we'd be going down the road. Um, but they, they keep bringing back the same argument. And, and I've never heard, honestly, I've never heard a rebuttal to the just enter into a royalty clause. Um, I mean, the reaction is sort of, yeah, well, I guess we could do that. But it's <laughs> yes, you could do that, and yes, you should do that, and yes, in in other states which have had this issue, uh, uh, that's something that uh, that's something that you should be doing, right? Uh, or that's something that, that they normally do, and and I just never heard you know anybody say, well, but we can't do it here because well, you can do it here. I mean, I've written contracts here. Is it because they're trying to protect the rate payers? Is that, I mean, is that, is the holy grail here that we want Alaska gas, but without having to pay more for it? Is that the, is that the magic bullet there? You know, Michael, it's, it's, but we would pay more for it. I mean, it, we would pay more for right. it in terms of reduced royalty and in terms of increased right. PFD cuts as a hidden consequence cost. of, of that reduced. But the difference between hidden costs and on, and on the table costs, right? Because if yeah. the rate payers had, I mean, I agree that that I think that's what it is, but is that the whole the holy grail of this whole thing is rate payers shouldn't have to pay anything else? It should be a hidden cost to the state in other ways. It it could be. There's another there's another piece of this maybe. Um, if you factor in the royalty costs, if you include the royalty costs in your purchase price, all of a sudden Cook Inlet gas becomes more expensive according to the the last year's utility study and the analysis of the very option, various options, all of a sudden Cook Inlet gas becomes more expensive than LNG. It, it, it starts ramping up on that scale to the point where LNG becomes a cheaper, an obviously cheaper option. So maybe part of this is, look, we know, we, we don't want to disclose how costly Cook Inlet is because then you're going to tell us, well, it's more economic as I've been saying, then you're going to tell us it's more economic to bring in LNG. So if we can hide a portion of these costs, we can continue with this fiction that Cook Inlet is cheaper and, and the costs will jump if we have to bring in imported LNG. Well, the costs are, I mean, basically what they're admitting is the costs are going to jump either way. The costs are either going to jump by the by somebody paying for the royalty, either either the purchasers or uh, the uh, uh, Alaskans through PFD cuts, somebody's going to pay for that. They just want to hide who's paying for it so it doesn't look as bad compared to LNG. I keep looking at this and I keep going back. You know, prior to the session starting, Brad, this is what really kind of got my attention on this to begin with, is that prior to the session starting, <clears throat> you really hadn't heard. There, I mean, there'd been a little bit of whispering about the, you know, the gas you know, decline in the Cook Inlet and everything else. And there, I think there'd been a story in the ADN about potential down the road kind of thing, but all of a sudden it was on the radar and it was one of the top three things that the legislature had to talk about was this energy thing. And then in the end, you know, very little really happened on it, but they keep priming the crisis button to try and get people off the mark. And it just, it starts to, it starts to wear thin. It starts to feel a little bit like, uh, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling kind of thing. Uh, the boy who cried wolf at some point uh, along the lines. And it starts making you ask the question about who's benefiting in that, you know, is this really about the people or is there something else? 
Yeah, I mean, what really sort of triggered this session's focus on it, I think, is is last winter's again crisis uh, when MSTAR lost a couple of wells in its storage field and lost the deliverability out of those storage fields, and at the same time as we were having, you know, a cold wave come through uh, come through South Central, and so things got a little close. There were additional things they could have done. Um, uh, uh, MEA, I think it's MEA, has the Eklutna. Uh, power plant that they had that they built that's dual fired. You can convert that to diesel and take it off gas for a while. And there's other things uh, they could have done. Um, and so it wasn't really that close, but but it was close. You know, sort of an, in normal working conditions, it was close. And so that's what they used as sort of the trigger into well, we got to do something. We got to do something. And in this state, we discussed this last time. In this state, uh, when when there's a when somebody starts saying we got to do something, we got to do something, the immediate reaction is, oh, we'll go to the legislature and get it done. If it involves money, we'll go to the legislature. If it involves, you know, something else, we'll go to the legislature. That's our reaction to a crisis. Not that's not that's not the reaction in other states. I mean, the other state is, oh shit, now we're going to have to pay more. Uh, you know, we're going to include a royalty clause in our contracts to get the gas. But that's you know that's a normal normal commercial transaction. It, it's it's usual, business. right? Yeah, and 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 lawyers know how to write these things, and we put it in the contract, and we get the and we get the gas, and we go on down the road. And what you then have is a market test. I mean, you have you have commercial purchasers making the decision to include that clause or include a half royalty clause, half reimbursement clause, trying to you know negotiate and find where the where the market price is. Um, you have that sort of test. Here, it's oh my god, we got a crisis. We got to get the state to do something, and because the state is the is the mineral interest owner the the recipient of the royalty right uh, you know unlike in other states where you'd have to go to the to the a bunch of royalty owners and deal with them although in louisiana the state is the royalty owner also for a lot of a lot of the gas down there but unlike where you'd have to go to the you know mineral interest owners and and deal with royalty clauses here you just go to the state and get the state to get the state to relieve you so it's it, it it's we don't deal with things in the normal way. It's 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 always the state's got to do this or the state's got to do that or you know we got to pour more money into it or we got to re, you know the state's got to back down on revenue. You know another good example is the is the child care tax credit that got passed this legislature. We're essentially going to pay companies companies in terms of reduced taxes for them to establish child care centers for their employees or whatever whatever uh universe of, of people that they're gonna they're gonna offer it to and and we have a child care crisis the state's got to do something the state's got to you know pour more money into it so we've decided to do it through tax credits uh reducing reducing revenue that way essentially again pushing it off on middle and lower income alaska families through pfd the state is continuously the sugar daddy of everything it's always the sugar daddy. they've got the money they've got the thing they're the royalty they could do it all it's continuous i mean that's the problem right now Yep, exactly right. And it's and and so you have I mean, if you get the state on a roll, if you get the state sort of leaning, oh, well, maybe there is a crisis that I that I need to do something about hold hearings, develop legislation. I guess you want to keep pushing for it. I mean, I, that's what what that's what Sims is doing is. Oh, but I almost I almost, ha I almost had him. Let's go. We're continuing now. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. It is the weekly top three, the big three issues that Brad feels are important for us to be paying attention to uh, in what's going on. And we continue. We just finished up with the the big uh, gas issue in the Cook Inlet and the potential for a special session. Now we get to Shell's West Harrison Bay. There was a decision on this. Uh, Shell has abandoned uh, the North Slope, uh, some North Slope leases, and it's raised some questions. And there's a decision there that Brad says has some implications. Brad, tell us what's going on here. Well, Nat Hertz, um, who's an independent reporter now and gets published in a in a variety of uh, journals and forums, Nat Hertz wrote a column recently, uh, the headline of which, at least the version that showed up in the ADN, is Shell abandons North Slope oil leases, raising questions about the industry's future in Alaska. And what that's talking about is a collection of leases that Shell owned in in an area known as West Harrison Bay, they're offshore leases uh, inside a bay um, uh, uh, in on the North Slope. The 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 thinking is that they are 
good leases, potential the uh, potential oil play, potentially significant oil play. Geographically, they're located just north of Anwar and just north, or not Anwar, just north of NPRA and just north of Oconico's Willow development and a little bit to the west of Oil Search's, Santos's um, uh, Pika development, both of which are major plays, major new plays on the North Slope. And there's and there's some, there's some speculation that the West Harrison Bay leases cover acreage that would have a continuation of those plays that underlie the Willow play and the and the Pika project, and thus have have a lot of a lot of potential. Shell has Shell uh, bid on those in 2020, the same year they they did the uh, uh, the off the OCS drilling, the offshore drilling, whatever year that was. They're all run together now. Um, Shell got those leases in West Harrison Bay, did a seismic evaluation or has done an evaluation of of what size of seismic information there is and think and thought that they had a good play there but they didn't want to develop them themselves they having been burned with the with the offshore development in alaska they they didn't want to go forward with themselves with it themselves so they were trying to sell out a portion of that keep a portion for themselves but sell out a portion and get somebody else uh to develop those leases somebody else to to take the heat if you will, for developing uh, leases in the Arctic, developing oil in the Arctic, and they've been in, and they were unable to to find anybody along the way. Uh, the way you hold leases on the North Slope, well, the, well, the way you hold leases in Alaska is you unitize them. Typically, you have to develop. I mean, the 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 language in the lease is you have to develop a lease uh, within a certain period of time, or the lease expires. You have to relinquish the lease or or various provisions take take control. Uh, in Alaska, we've developed this concept of unitization, which is a much different concept of unitization than there is in the lower 48. But we've developed this concept of unitization where you can pull a bunch of leases together and hold them all together based upon activity on any one lease. And Shell had unitized all these leases that it had gotten in West Harrison Bay uh, in order to hold them and and in order to market them as a as a unitized whole to other purchasers or other potential players, but no one Shell said no one stepped forward, but Shell had continued to hold on to the leases, trying to trying to achieve some value out of them. Uh, finally, uh, with some pressure put on by another producer, uh, Shell, the Department of Natural Resources, sort of put Shell to the to the test. And said, you know, you need to do something with this stuff. You either need right. to find find the third party, or you need to develop it yourself, or you need to relinquish them, give them back to the state. And and what Matt's Nat's reporting is on is Shell's decision to give them back to the state. Nat's blown that up a little bit and said, you know, it raises questions about the industry's future in Alaska. The story basically is that these were very valuable leases. You know, Shell didn't want to develop them because of the because of the optics of developing developing in the Arctic. Couldn't get anybody else to participate to develop them because of the optics in the Arctic, um, and had to give them back. And and so Nat sort of spins that into is this the death of the future oil industry in the state because you can't you can't find anybody who's willing to develop Arctic leases. I think that overstates the case. Uh, I mean, Conoco has pressed forward on the Willow project. Uh, you know, it, it had ample opportunity to bail on that project and to say, look, the, 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 the requirements that were the hoops we're having to jump through at the federal level are just too much. We're not going to we're not going to we're going to give this up and, and relinquish the leases back. They had ample opportunity to do that. They haven't done it. Uh, Santos, the, the Pika leases uh, didn't get developed for a long time. Armstrong had them, was was trying to market them, finally found first oil search and and now oil search has been acquired by Santos to proceed forward them and they're proceeding forward on the on the Pika project what this may say is is what we really knew when BP left which is major uh, uh super uh oil companies international global oil companies really aren't interested in being in Alaska anymore and developing Alaska resources anymore but that doesn't that doesn't mean everybody isn't. Conoco's still in here. Pika Oil Search Santos uh, is still in here. What it may say is is that that you're not going to get super majors in here, but it doesn't mean you're not going to get others in here. 
And it also may say that if you have to develop it in water on the on the North Slope, because that involves a bunch more federal regulations, that people and and also you have to build pipe under one underground pipelines, and also you get you know whaling implications up there. Uh, it may say if you have to develop it in water, that you're likely not going to go forward ahead. But I think I think what Willow and Pika is saying is yes, there is a future for the for the Alaska uh, oil industry. Uh, we're seeing two major projects being developed. Uh, I think if there are other fines on land, in particularly on state lands, particularly, uh, but you know, Conoco has sort of proven that even if it's on federal lands, the NPRA, I think I think you'll see people proceed forward with those. I don't I don't think it's the death knell that that Nat's article tries to imply it may be. Um, but it, it could be telling, and I mean, it's probably telling us that, yeah, the super majors really don't want to be here. Right. That, that BP has gone, that Shell's gone. We're not going to see Exxon who still owns an interest in Point Thompson, but's backed off being the operator. They've given that operatorship to Hillcorp. Uh, we, we won't see the super majors in here and we may not see water projects in here, but I don't think it's the death knell of the industry entirely. Well, and, and, and I think we've seen that for a while where the majors have backed off and it's the minor players that have come in and, and have swooped in to try and take up and pick up some of those pieces. Um, I think Nat's, uh, his opener in this piece is interesting because he does kind of highlight some of the optics of what maybe somebody from the outside of the state would be saying. He said the project in the Arctic is an undeveloped region of Alaska's North Slope, and while it's not in deep water, it's a slight distance offshore, which means drilling risks, provoking lawsuits and permitting challenges from conservation, read environmental groups, protests from local whaling captains, maybe even disruptions from climate activists at your next shareholder meeting. You call all the heads of other multinational oil companies that you sometimes work with to see if any of them want to buy a stake in the project, but they all bulk. So you take a pass, you hand it back to the state, what could ultimately be a highly valuable lease. You'll take your chances drilling somewhere else, probably in a region where you expect to be able to get the oil to market sooner before there's too much risk of declining global oil demand to mid adoption of new renewables. And so he's kind of painting the picture that we've seen. And really, this is kind of the picture that the environmentalists have been pushing for all across the, the country, right? To make it so onerous in Alaska, to make it so fraught with, with PR nightmares that uh, nobody wants to loan money for projects or do anything else. Uh, so in that case, they're winning, but the miners are still willing to take that challenge. I mean, if you know, picketing a, a shareholder meeting at Shell is different than picketing a, a shareholder meeting at, you know, Joe Bob's Oil Emporium, who's just a small little guy who, who is, uh, you know, maybe even a private company trying to do their thing, right? I mean, this is not, it's not the same thing. And so it's just a changing of the weather pattern rather than a full on change. Yeah, I mean, he does make a good point that that Arctic development, especially offshore development, would be expensive. Shell spent seven billion dollars ultimately drilling only one well uh, out uh, out out in western offshore western Alaska out in the OCS Outer Continental Shelf in western Alaska. Seven billion dollars, a lot of money, especially for one well, especially when the well doesn't doesn't you know prove your concept and 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 you sort of abandon the entire project. So, you know, Joe Bob's oil company, oil company isn't going to have seven billion dollars laying around. But what 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 Pika proves is a guy with a good concept, in that case, Armstrong, a guy with a good concept, you know, that can that can, that can prove his concept by drilling a few wells and attract outside investment, in his case, first oil search, uh, and now uh, and now Santos can attract uh, and, and Repsol. Repsol's a minor, Repsol's a Spanish oil company. Uh, uh, sort of mid-major companies can attract them, and and they'll bring in money, and they'll bring in expertise, and and go forward with development. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the bids are on Harrison Bay. Uh, there's a company that owns some adjacent leases uh, to Harrison Bay, a company called Narwhal, that was set up. Uh, in, in one of the employees is, or one of the owners is a former Shell employee who was involved in West Harrison Bay, so. He thinks there's a lot of act, a lot of potential there. Um, there are some minor players out there that that may bid on these leases, or we may have some a mid major come in and bid on these leases, um, and and try to proceed forward with them. They're state leases, so it's not going to be 
there's not going to be federal issues involved in trying to develop these in, in, involved in the lease sale. Um, so we may see some activity. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of activity um, we have on those. But just because the majors, the super majors are leaving, uh, I don't think is the death knell. I, BP left, um, and and well, I wouldn't say Hillcorp is a great replacement in terms of exploration. You've still got Santos and Repsol and Armstrong in terms of Pika, and you still got Conoco pressing forward. Uh, with willow so you've got mid to high mid majors that are still uh still pressing forward on these things yeah so it's it, <clears throat> what it is is a fundamental change right it's a fundamental change of moving from a, a market that is mostly um controlled or or targeted by the majors to one that is uh now um you know basically made up of small players uh, more than anything else so it's just a sea change more than a change in direction yeah and that's an important sea change i mean it, it's uh, again because of because of the financial resources that the super majors bring because of the the frankly the the scientific their tech arms technological arms that, that sort of advance the ball uh that's that's a significant change to, to lose the mid majors but I, but there's a difference between losing the mid, losing the super majors, super companies, and just going to zero. I, and I don't think we're, I don't think we're in that. I don't think we're in that drop. I think we're in the, we've lost the super majors, which is what we knew when we, when we lost BP, when BP packed up and left. But we've sort, of, but that's just sort of dropped us down a tier. It's not dropped us down uh, to the bottom. I, you know. <laughs> Nobody ever wants to lose super majors. Nobody ever wants to lose right. anybody from a market, uh, right. and, it's, and it's and it's not perfect. But I don't think it's. I don't think we say, well, this is the end, and and you know when we face the end, we have to go to the legislature and legislature legislature, legislature has to do things. So right. I don't. I don't think we're at that point. Right, because that was what we just discussed in in number one of the weekly top three was, if there's a crisis, go to the legislature. They'll break out the checkbook. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. He really does pump the, uh, uh, I guess, pump the uh, the emotional button, I guess, more than he's very good. Nat's a very good writer, and I do enjoy reading him. But, you know, welcome to Alaska's future, or really its present. I mean, this is after he sets it all up uh, to talk about all this stuff. But, I mean, really, this is what the environmentalists and a lot, I mean, he says conservationists, but it's read environmentalists at this point. They don't want to conserve. They want to preserve it in a pristine, you know, leave it in exactly the same state there, you know. Um, but this is what they were looking for. They were looking to hob, you know, to basically hobble the whole industry and to, uh, you know, hog time so that nobody wanted to do anything in the, in Alaska, if they go to China and do it, if they go to Indonesia and do it, if they go anywhere else and do it fine, but not in America, not in Alaska, that seems to be the answer. Well, and you know, and that they fundraise off on it, fundraise off on that. Right. I mean, you have polar bears that are, that are in commercials that, you know, stop the oil industry and save polar bears, uh, type of, uh, type of commercialization that's how they you know get money to pay their salaries and to and to keep going that's sort of a it's sort of their money making enterprise so yeah um but i just i and nat is a great writer and this is a great way of of presenting it um presenting the issue in a way that you know sort of gets people's attention and and, and gets people focused on whether there's something there's something uh, uh you know whether we are facing a death knell but I, but but Willow and Pika, I think, are much better indicators, frankly, of Alaska's future uh, than uh, than Harrison West Harrison Bay is. If you know, I, the West Harrison Bay is, story isn't over. The leases have come back to the state. The state's going to you know run another lease sale with respect to what the leases out in West Harrison Bay. We'll see what kind of interest there is uh, in it. Um, I suspect the leases will get picked up, and I suspect that. You know, somebody will sort of start the project over in a way, develop their own information, develop their own, and then they'll try to market it out to uh, to, to others. And we'll see whether, you know, there's another oil search out there, as there was for Armstrong that wants to, Repsol that wants to come in and, and play and, uh, and, and participate in it. But I, I don't, so I don't think the story's over. It, you sort of have to go through the next round of, of lease sales and see what the reaction to that is and see what happens. 
beyond that before you even write off West Harrison Bay. Right. But again, I, I think Willow and Pika are much better indicators of where the industry in Alaska is headed than the than, well, than this particular situation. Brad, I think you know, I, I seem to recall a while ago, maybe it was early on. I think we talked about when BP or maybe it was Exxon. I can't remember who was the first to pull out, but one of the majors was like, we're going to take our bat and ball and go home. And I was like, fine, take your bat and ball and go home. We, the resources are still here. And I said, maybe this will create, because remember some of these companies, when they first got started in Alaska, they were minor players. They were not major players uh, in the world on the world stage of oil and gas development. And it was through Alaska that helped them become world players. And so I said, fine, let the let the miners come in and build themselves up and maybe they'll become major players by working with Alaska, uh, you know, and and so to me, this is just kind of a change of it's again, it's a change of players more than anything else. They're not the majors with the gazillions of dollars in backing and everything else, but they also don't come with the baggage of being afraid that somebody's going to, you know, pick at their shareholder meeting at the same time. Right. Right. Yeah, it's a. Uh... Uh, it it is a change, um, and 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 we have seen that with BP. BP was the first to to pull the chain, and then and then Exxon sort of stepped back from the operator role over at Point Thompson. Uh, but we've seen you know the super major saying, "Yeah, our our time here is done. We've we've done what we're going to do. We've gotten the benefit that we're going to get, and our time here is done." And you know we have Hill Corp come in, not the world's greatest explorationist, certainly. Uh, but but come in and continue to develop and sort of continue to refine Prudhoe Bay. There's lots of oil left in Prudhoe Bay and continue to find ways to scrape the rocks in Prudhoe Bay. Um, and and we've seen uh, and and we've seen Armstrong attract Repsol and attract uh, oil search into the Pika project. And we've seen Conoco press ahead with the uh, with the Willow project. So it's not. I mean, it may be it may be one step back, but it's still it's sort of two steps forward. In terms of Willow and Pika, two steps forward and then a step back and then, you know, maybe another step forward. So it's just it's not all progressing, you know, right a pace. There there are there are challenges up here, but Pika and 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 Willow demonstrate that you can overcome those challenges. Right. I just don't think it's the doom and gloom that that, that Nat is saying here, like this is the end of an era. You know, maybe it's the end of the era of majors being the the big, you know, the 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 major contributors here. But I think it just offers opportunities for the miners to uh, come in here. And like you said, they're saying promote the fear in the chat room. Fear sells, and that's what I think it is. It's the fear of that point. Same thing with the oil and gas thing. It's the fear, right? The crisis. They keep mashing the crisis button. What happens when you keep giving the rats dopamine? The you know. That's what happens. All right, here we go. The Michael Duke Show, Common Sense, Liberty-based, free-thinking radio. We continue. Brad Keithley is our guest. Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. You can find them at ak4sb.com. He's on Twitter. He'd love to fight with you on Twitter at any time. Facebook. He's got the weekly column in the Alaska Landmine and everything else. Uh, the weekly top three continues. Now down to number three, which is... Hey, where's the phase two utility report on the South Central gas? I mean, this was this was coming out, right? I mean, we were just talking about mashing the the crisis button over and over and over again. Oh, it's a crisis, you know, gas, gas in the inlet. Gas. And there was supposed to be a secondary report that gave more information, just like there was supposed to be a secondary report on the defined benefits thing. And of course, it never really kind of showed up. And maybe it did, and it's sitting in a drawer somewhere because it doesn't tell you exactly what they want to hear. Brad, where is the phase two report? What's going on here? I don't know where the phase two report is, Michael. I wish I did. So this sort of loops back to the first the first issue, the Cook Inlet issue. Last year, the utilities financed and and gave a lot of press, a lot of publicity around a report do, done by some consultants on what the alternatives wa were for dealing with the with the Cook Inlet. They actually started it back when Hillcorp announced shortly after Hillcorp announced that it wasn't going to extend contracts. Uh, for Cook Inlet gas, that they didn't see the economics to continue to develop their interests in the Cook Inlet, and so they were going to sort of ramp down by closing out contracts in the Cook Inlet. The utilities got together and set up this the study group that that hired consultants and and went in and 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 had had them look at uh, Cook Inlet alternatives, and they did a great job. 
They did a great job. The consultants did a great job at looking at the alternatives. They developed the economics uh, of what those alternatives were, compared them to each other, sort of ranked the ranked the choices, and uh, and 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 produced this report last July. That that frankly is a is a great data tool uh, to analyze what's going on in the Cook Inlet. But they they called it the Phase One report, and they said and they said there's going to be a Phase Two report. And and the target date for the phase two report was the end of 2023 to make a decision on long-term options, which long-term option they were going to pursue or which multiple short-term options they were going to pursue and, and then kick off uh, sort of the implementation phase of getting, getting whatever solution they found um, in place. Um, and you know, one of the recommendations was to focus in on LNG and see that LNG, imported LNG was viable, that the economics were accurate about it, and let's come together and then let's, because it's going to take a while to get the LNG facilities in place, let's go forward and do that. Um, the phase two report's never shown up. <laughs> I mean, I keep asking about it and keep getting sort of, yeah, it's out there, but, but, but it's never shown up and, and it's never been presented in public. If it's done, it's never been presented in public. The options have never been talked about, and so we really don't know what it what it says about 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 the way forward. We know what what people wanted to do in the legislature; they wanted to prolong the Cook Inlet by subsidizing Cook Inlet producers or purchasers or whoever they were subsidizing, but but they never came out with this additional analysis they were supposed to be doing about the relative merits. Of the various solutions, they just sort of honed in on we're going to subsidize the Cook Inlet, and that's our solution, uh, without you know sort of more fully developing the LNG option. It's not that it's not that the LNG option isn't out there. I mean, Marathon had Marathon bought the old Conoco export plant. Uh, we used to export uh, LNG out of the Cook Inlet. We had surplus L uh, surplus gas in the Cook Inlet, and and in the 1970s, I think it was, we built, or maybe the 1960s, we Conoco built Phillips at the time. Conoco at the time, anyway. Phillips, Phillips at the time, built the built the Cook Inlet uh, uh, ex, uh, uh, Kenai LNG export plant, and exported up until 2010, I think it was, um, and and had it going. And uh, and you can't automatically use an LNG export plant for imports. You have to sort of reverse the equipment. Uh, in a way, or put in new right. equipment to be able to do uh, imports, but they had the they had the pier, they had the they had the you know sort of the a lot of the pieces parts in place. They had the pipelines feeding it that could be reversed to take gas away. They sort of they sort of had the kit there, and and they didn't tear it down. They mothballed it. Conoco mothballed it when they uh, when they stopped uh, exporting LNG. Marathon bought it from them because prices in the Cook Inlet got so high. At one point, gas prices in the Cook Inlet got so high relative to LNG prices that Marathon thought they were going to be able to make money by buying the in, the facility and import gas uh, import gas into uh, into in, for use at the at the Marathon refinery, the old Tesoro refinery down on the Kenai. So right, they bought it and they've had it. They've even got it first certificated to to import. Uh, import LNG. I mean, they've got all of the permits that they need to be able to go forward and and make the design switch to make it an import facility for their own use. They'd have to go back. Excuse me. They'd have to go back and amend that FERC certificate to make it available to you know to import LNG that they would then sell to third parties. But they've got a lot of that work done. So it's not like we don't know that there's an LNG facility around that could be used for. For, for meeting the objective, but the reports never come out. So I'm, I mean, that's part of what adds to my suspicions about what's going on uh, with respect. If there's another agenda going on with what with what the, the is being pursued in the legislature uh, on the Cook Inlet, give us if that's the best option. If subsidizing producers in the Cook Inlet is somehow the best option for Alaska, go ahead and publish the report. Or right. finish the report if you haven't finished it, and give us the range of options. Give us the information on the range of options. Uh, but they haven't done it. So, I, so there's a question in my mind about 
why do we not have that second report? In a presentation, right. in a presentation to the RCA a couple months ago, two gatch electric with the RCA had called up all the utilities, South Central Utilities, and said, What's your plan if we run short on gas? And Chugach had come up and, and had made a presentation about, you know, who it was going to curtail and all that sort of stuff. It was asked the question, well, what about, you know, what about additional supplies? Where's, you know, LNG, you know, the phase one report said LNG is a good, good prospect. When do you need to make a decision to go forward? And the guy from Chugach said, well, we at least need to make it. It was sort of like we need to have made it yesterday but we at least need to make it by the end of the second quarter of this year. Well, that's the end of June and that's coming up fast. And if we don't even have the information published upon which to make that, make that decision, it's uh, it's, it's problematic. So Michael, that's, that's, this is another, where, where's the report? Right. There's another piece that adds to my suspicion that there's another agenda going on with respect to, you know, what the, what the utilities are trying to do and what the producers are trying to do with respect to the royalty relief. Well, uh, any yeah, any time that they highlight, oh, this report's coming and it's going to justify our position on anything. I mentioned the defined benefits thing earlier because they were doing a deeper report and you know whatever, uh, and then that report mysteriously never surfaces or never comes forward or is talked about. It, it always raises my suspicion because then it doesn't. Ju- it, it, to me, it basically says, oh. Well, it doesn't justify your position. That's why you don't want to highlight the report. You know, same kind of thing. What you'll find probably in this report is that just like the defined benefits plan, where it was going to be more expensive than they ever said it was going to be. In this case, it probably shows that justifies that importing LNG is still the best option. And that's not what they want to talk about. And that, and I think that's probably the, the, the answer there. 90 seconds. Go ahead. Uh, and there's other things. NSTAR has proposed a new pipeline to build a pipeline down to uh, to the Matsu port um, uh, and, and, and proposing to build an LNG plant there when we've got the Marathon plant already in existence, LNG plant already in existence. It's just, there's just, it, there's not clarity about what the heck's going on behind the curtain. Uh, and people are pursuing, I think, different agendas for, di- for different reasons, non-transparent reasons. That makes me really suspicious about why we need to be continuing to pursue this legislation uh, uh, on the Cook Inlet. Fear sells. They're all saying it. Brian says it in the chat room, you know, and and uh, Terry's saying it and, and everything else. Um, you know, th- this is a big question. Now, Brian asked, who owns the report? You know, this Util- second, the second phase reports. Is it the utilities that are that are reporting it? Yeah, the utilities, the utilities have paid for it, so so they own it. Uh, but here's uh, the RCA, the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, which has jurisdiction over the utilities and has the obligation to to re- to monitor them and regulate them with respect to their obligation to serve. I mean, utilities have the obligation. Utilities have a certificated service area. They have an obligation to serve that service area. They they are responsible for coming up with the supplies and building the kit necessary to serve that area. So the utilities have the obligation to go out and get the gas. Uh, the RCA has the obligation to monitor and to regulate, and to and to push them to make certain make certain they have they have the gas supplies. Last year, when the Phase One report was presented, it was presented in front of the RCA. Big fanfare, big presentation, slide decks. The consultants came, the utilities came. Everybody talked to it, uh, and they talked about you know there'd be a Phase Two report as they narrowed down the options and started into the implementation phase. Well, the RCA has called up all the utilities to talk to them about what their plans are in the event of the shortage, but I've not seen the RCA press forward on where's the phase two report. You know, you said you were gonna give us the phase two report. You said you were right. gonna narrow down the options. Where's the phase two report? So th- the question is not only to the utilities, <coughs> excuse me, about where's the phase two report, but the question also is to the RCA, why aren't you pressing forward on the phase, phase two right. report? Why aren't, you, why aren't you pressing utilities to present it? Yeah, why aren't you asking? Uh, why aren't you asking for that uh, report? I mean, if they if they highlight it, it says, "Oh, there's more to come." Why aren't they giving you that more? Is it because it doesn't bolster their position? I mean, inquiring the, minds want to know. Yeah, that's the suspicion. That's the suspicion is in the absence of information. In the absence of information about 
about the LNG options and and you know in the absence of of any understanding of of defining those options better <laughs> then you know we're just going to press forward for this royalty relief in the Cook Inlet and it's just uh, it, it there's just there's not a transparency to this that that makes me feel and you know I'm somebody who's been around this issue for a heck of a long time there's not a transparency to this issue that makes me feel like like I understand what the story is and I understand why we need uh, this legislation. It feels a lot more like somebody's going to do better. Somebody's going to do better dollar wise. <laughs> Excuse me. Somebody's going to do better with dollar wise with this legislation. And they don't want us to know all this other information because they're going to do better dollar wise. So right. let's get to the, let, let's get the legislation through. Uh, not tell everybody, you know, the rest of the story. Let's get this legislation through and, uh, and sneak it through, you know, claiming there's a crisis and and uh, and 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 we'll all be better off. And we'll sort of chuckle in the background about, wow, didn't we, didn't we just pull off a great one? We'll curl our mustaches, <laughs> snidely whiplash in the background. Um, yeah, it's a little frustrating. Um, we keep hearing that there's going to be more, again, it was this, I keep, I keep going back to the defined benefits thing, but you know, we keep hearing, we saw the reason people go up and say, this is going to be a lot more expensive than you're saying, oh, well, we've got cost. We'll pass it and then we'll figure it out kind of thing. And it always makes me leery. I mean, it's like the report on the election stuff, right. From uh, that Mike shower was trying to get from the OMB for years, uh, still hasn't gotten the report. I mean, it just says why why all this why all the skull drudgery? Why all the cloak and dagger? It's because somebody's benefiting somewhere. I, I'll tell you that. That's the thing. These reports get buried because somebody is benefiting somewhere. I would just like to know where they're benefiting and who's benefiting from what. Yeah, and 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 you know, this NSTAR faint that I was talking about earlier, mentioned earlier, NSTAR has proposed a new pipeline to run down to the to the Matsu port, the Kinnikarum port. Uh, fifty million dollar pipeline, new pipeline, and that's just to get just to get to the pipeline to the port. Then they have to build the LNG import facility at the port. So we're talking about multiples of additional cost, and that's coming out about the NSTAR is making this faint at the same time as they're making the push for the right. Cook Inlet royalty relief. <laughs> when the marathon plant's sitting right there, exactly, it's there. It's the built. existing dock and a FERC certificate. To go ahead and 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 at least the initial first certificate to go ahead uh, and and proceed forward. So it's just there's just facts that are just wrong. Yeah. I mean, when you when you say there's a crisis and and start makes this faint this fifty million dollar faith, there's just they're just wrong. Right. There's going something else going on. Yeah, I'd, I would like to know. Uh, inquiring minds would like to know. Well, I don't um, care if I, I don't care if I know or not. I just don't want to pass royalty relief in the midst of all this. Yeah, and let somebody rip off the state, which is what royalty relief is. Let somebody rip off the state when when we know that's not the right alternative. When we know there's cheaper alternatives for Alaska. Yeah. All right, Brad. Final thoughts as we come into the election season. What are you watching? Give it to me here in about thirty seconds. Saturday, five p.m. is the filing date. Uh, we don't have all the candidates in yet. There may be some surprises yet. There was an article in the ADN that said. Uh, that said uh, there's a lot of incumbents that still don't have opponents. Maybe that will change by Saturday. But next week, we're going to be talking about who's running and, and and what does that mean for the coming legislature? Yeah, I got to tell you, it's a little disheartening to see a lot of empty slots right now. Uh, there's not much time, so we got to get into that. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. As always, it's good to talk with you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.